All right, well, welcome everyone um, to the Tampa Bay History Center. So my name is Brad Massey. I'm the Saunders Foundation Curator of Public History at the Tampa Bay History Center. I was the author of Cuban Pathways, so if you have any criticisms, just keep them to yourself. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm absolutely joking. Um, one of the joys of being the curator is I get the ability to work with a great creative team here. My colleagues, Teresa Silva, Heather Culligan, the marketing team, all the people in the collections department, and we get to create things. So what I love is reactions, right? I like them to be positive, but I also like it when we get different types of human reactions. So we're here today to talk about the exhibit, and we invite you all to be part of our conversation. Um, the way it's going to work today is Lizette uh, Marucci and I are going to just kind of sit around, talk about the exhibit. You're going to hear sort of the dispassionate historian uh, tell the story of how the exhibit came together. You're going to hear some first-hand uh, accounts from my colleagues. And so the idea is to give you different experiences. And tonight, instead of having a traditional lecture, you're going to hear a conversation. And so we're going to welcome your questions um, near the end of the program. And we'd like to hear what you think about the work that we've done here. Um, so before I start, I have to do a couple of the big plugs here. Um, of course, Florida Conversations is a free monthly lecture series. Today it's actually a conversation that's made possible thanks to the support of the Tampa Bay History Center's Endowment Fund with USF, um, AARP of Florida, and USF Libraries. And media support is provided by WUSF Public Media. Last thing I want to say before I go and sit down and join Lizetta Marucci is um, for our audience on Zoom, please use the Q&A button to ask questions at any point during the program. We'll share these questions at the end of the program, and the recording of tonight's um, conversation is going to end up on YouTube because you're just, you know, you can't get enough. You're going to have to watch this again and again and again. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to join my colleagues, and um, I'm going to kick it off, and then we're going to have a conversation. In the beginning. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to introduce my colleagues um, here for the, the talk tonight. Uh, this is Marucci, and she was very important. I know a lot of you know her. She was very important in um, kind of the early um, development of this exhibit, and we're going to talk a little bit about her personal experience and um, some of the artifacts that we were very fortunate that she loaned us for the show. And then, of course, we're going to talk to Lizette, and um, I'm going to pass it over to Lizette. She's going to be sort of our ringleader um, today. Um, and I guess, Lizette, just to, to kind of get you started, um, you know, you've seen Cuban Pathways now. You, of course, are a Cuban-American. Yes. So kind of as a Cuban American, what, you know, what's your sort of take on the exhibit and, you know, how it might or might not relate to your experience? I have to say that over the years, you know, I was born in New York. My parents came from Cuba in 19, 1961. They were political refugees. And so in our house, you know, they really um, stressed the importance of knowing our roots, knowing our Cuban history. So, of course, anytime there was a Cuban exhibit of any kind, we were taken to the exhibits and your exhibit is the best exhibit on Cuba that I have ever seen. Well, thank so you. thank you for doing this. It's really extraordinary. <laughs> and, and what I love most about it is that you tell these stories through uh, the eyes of three different families from Cuba who lived in different times of Cuban history. And I have a special connection with the Cuban Chinese family because part of my family was from Canton, China, who immigrated to Cuba, fell in love with the Cuban woman, and then you know the rest, as they say, is history. So I just love that you have that in your exhibition. That's something that's not very common. So that's what I love about it. I think it is the best exhibit on Cuba that I've ever seen. Well, thank you very much. I think the program's over. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's get out of here. I mean, it does, a plug doesn't get better than that. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Did you want to ask Marucci about her jewelry tonight? Oh. Yes, yeah, should we start off there? So um, Marucci, kind of like you, Lizette, you know, has a first-person experience of obviously a very Cuban-American story. And part of that story is the artifacts that Marucci was kind enough to loan us for the show, but also some of the things that you're actually wearing right mm -hmm. now. So maybe that's a good place for us to introduce you to the crowd, Marucci. You can talk a little bit about your experience Buenas and the items. Buenas noches y bienvenidos. <laughs> it's wonderful having you here tonight. 
And the story of Cuban Pathway starts with a small, just a small conversation I had with CJ, our, the president of the History Center, several years ago. CJ, when are we going to do an exhibit on Cuba? It belongs to Tampa. Tampa's had Cubans 100 years longer than Miami. This doesn't make any sense. We need an exhibit on Cuba. He goes, well, give me some time. I guess we needed to have Brad join the crew. This is the yes. best conversation <laughs> yes. ever. He's A big awesome. Fan so far. And so therefore, but the wonderful thing about Cuban Pathways and then the unique thing of Cuban Pathways and people's reactions to Cuban Pathways have seen I didn't know that. I get that a lot from people. I had no idea that there were Cuban Chinese in Cuba. And we're not just talking about a few, we're talking about a lot. Didn't realize about the Tainos. When you get to see the exhibit, Indian. you'll get to see about the native people that lived in the Caribbean that started it all. And they were very, very bright people. So you'll see some of their, the things that they used to survive and live. As to my story, I was born in Cuba. I was born in Cuba, and at the age of eight, my father was born in Agost, Alicante, in Spain, which is a province in Spain, similar to Valencia, and as Florida, Georgia, it's a state of Spain. So he was born in a little town called Agost, and they were clay makers, alfareros, as well, we call don't say too much because we want to make sure we save it for the pictures. I was going to get to the jewelry. To the jewelry. Okay, okay. got it. So, <laughs> so I wanted to give you a background as to why I'm wearing this jewelry. So as he came from Spain uh, and came to Cuba, his country was, you know, he had lost his country in Spain because of the anarchists, came to Cuba, started all over, and 45 years later, here comes this man with a beard and takes it away again all over. So we had to leave because we didn't want to leave and we did not want to live under communism. We were terrified because we didn't know what was going to happen. We were obviously the place to go was the United States of America where we used to do a lot of business. And so the day we chose to leave, or the day that we were destined to leave, I was eight years old. I just turned eight years old. And on the morning ride to, I was hidden in the car on the morning ride to Havana, because it would have been unusual to see a eight -year, an eight-year-old out of school riding in the back seat of a car at three o'clock in the morning. So when we get to Havana, my mother go to the hotel room where we always stay, and my mother said, Mother, I want, to, I want to dress you. And I'm going, you want to dress me? Yes, I want you to wear this and this and this, and this, and more stuff, even more stuff, because you're a child. They're going to think it's junk jewelry, and they won't question you about it. And in case we can't find jobs, we can sell these gold coins to eat. And that's basically the story of how we left. We left with nothing, zero, not $20, not $5. They took all of our silver change at the airport. Mm -hmm. And as we say goodbye, we're coming to America, these coins really kind of like, they're still here. We survived. My, fa my parents found a way to live. The coins are still here and they will go on to my son and his son or daughter or whomever survives this because this is a sign of survival. And that's why I'm wearing them today. Yay. I, I love the way, I love the way Maruchi tells that story. And you know, and her mother was brilliant because she was eight, and they didn't think anything of what she was wearing. My mom, on the, uh, on the contrary, was just turned 19 when she left, and they took everything. The soldiers at the airport took everything from her, from the rings to the earrings to the doll that she was bringing with her. Um, so your mom was spot on giving you to wear all those items because they didn't think twice about the little girl. They must have thought you were quite you know the princess with all they this jewelry they probably thought i was a hitana which means a <laughs> gypsy so <laughs> we're having all this stuff up. so we what we've done is we have taken a lot of the artifacts that are in the exhibit and we thought that we wanted to share with you just a little bit more so you're going to hear tonight things that you wouldn't ordinarily find out by walking through the exhibit and um and so we're going to do like a quick round table discussion on these really fast so that we can get to more of them so we've separated this into four sections we're going to talk about specific artifacts then we're going to pivot to why tampa why we're doing it here and why it's so appropriate and then the third aspect we're going to cover is the issue of race and diversity in cuba at the turn of the century and then we're going to end it with what i like to call the corner the corner which we've noticed and i'm not surprised elicits the most intense emotional response from people when they walk into that section of the exhibit 
So um, let me remind all of you who are watching via Zoom to please use that Q&A icon um, on your Zoom link and you can send us your, your questions. Um, we have Amanda on our team who is going to be sending us your questions so that we can answer them during the Q&A. So I just wanna make sure that you know if you're watching that yes, we will get to your questions as well as the questions here in the audience. Um, so Brad, let me start with you. What can you tell us really quickly about some a very small piece in the exhibit it's a handkerchief yeah a handkerchief so when i before i describe the handkerchief really quick i'll tell you as the curator one thing i always want to do is i want to work with the collections team to find objects that meet people on different levels as one of my colleagues put it one time the exhibit works well we did a good job because it has a lot of different textures right different shapes yes. different sizes yes and so when it comes to textures when we were going through some of the uh, objects that we have here in the history center we looked at this and this is a really interesting piece this is a handkerchief that was given to spanish soldiers and you may say well you know who cares why is that a big deal well the interesting thing about it is this is a handkerchief that has military instructions on it it tells yeah. you how to ambush it tells you how your weapon works which, which is a remington weapon and so it was given to spanish soldiers in the field in cuba and it speaks to a couple things. Number one, what was often their lack of military training. I mean, we're gonna get you out there, we're gonna get you armed, you're gonna go fight in Cuba. The other reason we like the piece is it's in Cuba long before the United States is involved in the Cuban war, the long running Cuban right. war for independence. And that's one thing we wanted to do in the exhibit. We talk a lot about kind of like, you know, Lizette and Marucci were just talking about the ties between the United States and Cuba but one goal as the curator I had was to go deeper. You know, this isn't just about the United States. This isn't just about the 20th century. It's about the long story of Cuban history. Mm -hmm. And so this piece takes us all the way back to the 1800s. So even wow. though it's, it's torn up, <laughs> if, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, if you, if you go up to the gallery, you'll see, you know, it's not in the best condition, but that's part of the, the provenance, right, of the actual piece. So we really loved this handkerchief when we saw it and we realized it's telling an important part of the story and it's giving the exhibit an interesting texture. So Brad, let's go from the smallest, very small item to a big item, the chug boat. Let's see the picture of the chug boat. There it is. Yeah, Tell us the about chug that. Boat. So, you know, I always say this to my I always say this to my colleagues. I say, um, well, I like big stuff, right? I want to have some big <laughs> stuff in the exhibit. And um, for me, one of the big things we needed was a crossing vessel because I thought, well, how do I tell the texture of taking to the sea? This is part of the story, Lizette, a lot of people probably know. You know, in 1959, after the, the revolution, a lot of people get on freedom flights. Yes. A lot of people go to the Havana airport and they fly out like the Chinese family that we're gonna talk about. That's what happens to the Changsu family. Um, but a lot of people desperately take to the sea. And I thought, well, how can I really capture as the curator the emotion of that? Sure, I can talk about it. I can show you pictures of people on balsas, you know, Marucci. I can show you people's on rafts that are desperately trying to, to cross. But what I really need is a vessel yes. that's going to tell that story. I want the guests to come around and I want them to encounter it. So that was one reason that we worked so hard to get a chug. And then I don't want to talk too much about it because we'll probably, you know, come back to it, Lizette. But this was one of the hardest pieces to get for the exhibit. You know, you <laughs> would think, you know, there's been thousands of these, these made that have crossed the straits. Um, shouldn't they just be out there? But it was very difficult. And we realized for us, it became important to get a really recent vessel. This vessel crossed in September of 2021. It's just a few short months mm -hmm. ago. Um, and for us, it was worth the time, a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> I can tell you that story <laughs> peripherally later. Um, but it's a piece that has a certain texture that elicits an emotion, right? Absolutely. Um, we can't put ourselves in the 12 people that crossed in this vessel. We successfully, can't put yes, yeah, they successful. did make it. Mm -hmm. We can't put ourselves in their shoes, Lizette, but when we look at the boat, we can start to get a feeling of what it must have been like. And we'll get to the questions afterwards, if you don't mind. Um, the, uh, we'll get to the aroma of this chug boat a little later in the program. I'm gonna ask um, Brad to explain um, the, the unique smell that this thing had when it got here. <laughs> But if um, I understand correctly, Brad, the efforts crossing the Florida Straits, this chug boat, all of this, unfortunately, the people that came were returned. 
Yeah, so there's an interesting story behind the boat. Um, 12 people cross in September, as I told you, mm -hmm. and then they land right by the southernmost point buoy. I assume most of you or some of you have at least been to Key West and you've stood by the little buoy and you've mm -hmm. taken your picture. It's like a rite of passage, right? Mm -hmm. um, back when I was there, there would always be some dude that was hanging out there and you'd give him a dollar and he would take your picture. That was before the selfie. Um, <laughs> but that's where they landed. and. Um, once they landed, the only thing I knew about this vessel is they were apprehended by the Border Patrol shortly thereafter. So I don't know if they were deported. I don't know if they were allowed to stay. Of course, wet foot, dry foot is over now, Lizette. So yes. that policy, when Cubans land on American soil, they can apply for um, exile. Um, mm -hmm. That's gone. And so what happened with this vessel is I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the federal government, and it was immediately denied. They got back to me in like two days. I was really impressed. <laughs> I've never been rejected so quickly. Um, <laughs> so unfortunately, I didn't get the story of these 12 individuals. But then for me as a museum professional, that becomes part of the story, Absolutely. Um, the story yeah. behind the item. Maruchi, I'd like to ask you about the document that's in the exhibition that means so much to your family. Um, when everything was federalized, you are one of the few people who I've ever met who has the papers when the family's business was nationalized. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that paper. Well, I think as any of my Cuban friends in the audience can attest to, and in the, on the Zoom audience can attest to the fact that we all thought we were going back in a year. We all thought this was going to be done in a year, two years, three years, four years. Well, my parents brought the nationalization papers with them because in the event that we were able to return to Cuba, here's proof, this is what we owned. Mm -hmm. And so when my father, when my parents died, I went to the, uh, our family you know, safe, and, or actually the, at the bank depository box, and found a folder with all of this documentation on there, yeah. including their nationalization papers when my father became a Cuban citizen from having been a Spanish citizen, uh, my mother's um, certificate of residency, my fourth, my second grade new report card, which was like from Harlem, Georgia. I mean, it's- I <laughs> should have put that on display. Yeah, I, I'm I, sure. Did you solve <laughs> Marucci talks too much. No, nevertheless, it's, um, so that's why the, we were, I, I'm just so lucky that those papers are here and it's pretty large. It's basically, they show up at the location of our brick plant and our manufacturing facility and they make my father sign this paper that says this no longer belongs to you. By that time, they had frozen our bank accounts and at, right after they went to the factory, we went, they went to our home and told my mom, two militiamen holding a rifle in front of three women that had no weapons or no defense, this no longer belongs to you. If you choose to leave, you can take one suitcase with personal property only because this entire apartment or this entire home has been inventoried mm -hmm. for the goods inside. And when you talk about inventory on the paper, Brad pointed it out, you see things like one bulldozer. And the, the document is about 12 pages long, so it gets to the end of the document. It says five chickens, three cows. They inventoried everything that belonged to the Azarine family. Yeah, it's a really interesting document, too, if I can jump in, Lizette, yes, real absolutely. quick. Um, one of the kind of the joys, but also the challenges as the curator is when you meet somebody like Marucci that has this great like repository of documents. And it was true with the Chang Suit family, too, the Chinese-American family mm -hmm. that I worked with here in town. There's all these things that they're very tied to. And it's my job to be like, all this stuff is great. I love it. But I only can take, you know, yeah. X, Y, and double Z. And so for me, when I took this document, um, I said, this is great. But I don't have the space to put 12 pages on display. So what you'll see when you go up is you'll see the family's manufacturing brochure. And then mm -hmm. you'll see where they start to list out some of the things. And I like big things, like I told you. So the bulldozer family or the company bulldozer gets confiscated. Some of the company's cows get confiscated. A pickup truck gets confiscated. So that's kind of how I work as the curator. And then I took some of Marucci's other family documents, like the manufacturing um, document, and I kind of pieced together, well, what things can I use? And this is really important. What do I have room for? Right. When you walk through the exhibit space, 
you probably don't realize how intentional everything is. We have to do math against the walls to figure out how <laughs> things things how things relate to each other. Mm -hmm. And a lot of ways, my job is to tell the biggest story I can with the smallest number of items. And that can be very frustrating. I would love to put all 12 pages up, but that's mm -hmm. not going to work. So just kind of give you an idea of some of the things that we do, Lizette, when we try to put together the show. The, the one document that I found shocking, I did not expect to see, was a war bond. Can you quickly tell the audience about that? Yeah, so I told you I love big things, but little things have texture too. And this is a really cool thing that we had here in our collection. And this is a revolutionary war bond to fund Cuban independence. The reason this is so interesting is it was paid for for $2 by a Tampa cigar factory worker long before the United States is involved in the war. And so for me as the curator, it's a great item because I can say this is how dedicated certain workers were to Cuban independence. They left the island, they came here to Tampa Lizette, they formed new families, or they formed families like Marucci's family did, mm -hmm. but they still have a lot of, in a lot of ways, their hearts are still in Cuba. And in the yeah. 1800s, their hearts were still dedicated to Cuban independence. So it's a really cool piece where I can tell the story of a very common person, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. right, that's gonna fund a revolutionary cause long before the country that he's living in now gets involved. So it's a really cool piece, yeah. Lizette, to talk about the ties between Cubans and Tampa um, during the revolutionary period. Earlier tonight, you all heard Marucci um, tell the story of how she told the museum, you know, please, let's do something here in Tampa. It should be Tampa. Tampa had Cubans 100 years before Miami ever did. And so a lot of folks do not know that, Brad. You know, why Tampa? Why is that tie between Tampa and Cuba so old and so established? Yeah, it goes way back. Even before the cigar factories, there was a lot of Cuban fishermen that would come along the West Coast, and they'd create these little Cuban fish fishing villages, a lot of which were temporary. But um, even in the 1820s, when they build Fort Brooke, the U.S. military institution down here in Tampa, they note this, right? Oh, there's, there's Cuban fishermen that are around. Um, but then, of course, it really gets going after the 1880s, when we see the cigar factories set up, mm -hmm. that's when thousands and thousands of Cubans are gonna start to come over. And so you have different Cuban ties that stretch. You know, when you think about the tie between Cuba and Miami, in a lot of ways, it's a very post-1959 story. And the Castro story is so important down there for obvious reasons. But in Tampa, it's a much longer story, Lizette. Absolutely. And that's yeah. one thing we kind of wanted to, or we didn't kind of want to, we wanted to express to the guests that come and see the show. And you do so well. well thank I mean, you. you. You cover, the exhibit covers 500 years of history in Cuba. Did you all know that the first baseball team in the Tampa Bay area was in 18, I believe it was 1887. It was started by Cuban cigar rollers. They brought their love of baseball to Ybor City. Um, so let's talk about race and diversity and how you cover that in the exhibit. Brad, I'd like to ask you to explain, um, there's an insurance policy that's very interesting. The item is insuring an Afro-Cuban slave. Can you explain that? I think yeah. we have a picture of it. Yeah, this is a really important document to me because one thing I do as the curator, I like to say, is I create a very big problem and then I have people at the History Center help me solve it. And so I thought to myself, well, how am I going to tell 500 years of Cuban history and then tell diverse stories? And so one of the pathways through the exhibit is an Afro-Cuban pathway. And I had some really interesting pieces that our partners allowed us to borrow. For example, the Mel Fisher down in Key West. This is one thing museums do a lot. You know, I reach out, I say, oh, I'm putting together an exhibit. Will you loan me some items? And they loaned me some copper that um, enslaved people had mined in southeastern Cuba. And I was like, okay, this is a real cool piece because it speaks to the labor of the enslaved. But I said, the problem with this piece is it doesn't give them a name, right, Lizette? It doesn't, it doesn't personify them. Right. So then I reached out to the University of Miami and they were like, we have a trove of documents. You know, you can look through them and you know, you can, you can use them. And I found this document. And the reason I like it is because the person's name is right there. His name is Jose, right? We can literally give him a name in the gallery space. Mm -hmm. He's been insured. Why has he been insured? Because the body of the enslaved people were some of the most valuable things in Cuba. Here in Louisiana, heading up to the Civil War, over 80% of loans were backed by the bodies of the enslaved. 
So I can talk about how Jose's body is literally commodified, right? It's insured. Mm -hmm. And then talk about how important slavery was to Cuba in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s. So I think it, it, it lends itself to an interesting textural component to the exhibit. There, there's another item in the exhibit that is about a, a person who is biracial. We've got the picture. Here is a picture of uh, the painter Vicente Escobar, and he was so good at his, at his talent that he became a painter of the Royal Chamber in 1827. And when he died, he was actually listed in the obituaries with white Cubans. Um, so that's such an interesting, there he is there. And then, oh, that's not it. That's yeah, that's not, the chance. That's, that's that's but I'll talk about Vicente but that's, Escobar. But that's so cool. And yeah. so let's let's go ahead and, and, and go to the Cuban Chinese story. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and so we talk about the Changsut family. I want to make sure I pronounce that correctly. I want to start with Maruchi first um, and then go to you, Brad. Maruchi, you know, tell them about, you know, quien eran los cubanos chinos en, en Cuba. Who were the Cuban Chinese in Cuba? Cuban Chinese were tailors. They are initially, they're tailors, they were cooks, they were laundry, they, the famous Chinese laundries, and those still existed in America when I first came. You'd go looking for a Chinese laundry. Well, they came to Cuba. They, most of the uh, Chinese Cubans that came, came from Canton, and they came as indentured servants. Once they worked off their indenturement and they had worked either in the railroad or picking sugar, they decided this was going to be their new home. So they established communities throughout. We had a community of, of Chin Chinos Cubanos in Camagüey. There were some in Havana mm -hmm. with their own cemeteries. Brad could probably attest to some of these things. They became part of our culture. There's nothing better. Next time you go to a Cuban restaurant, find out if they've got Cuban Chinese Cuban, rice, Cuban fried rice, Cuban because fried it's rice. the best in the world. <laughs> because the two flavors of Cuban food and Chinese fried rice make the best. So we it's we cherish so much yeah. our, our Cuban our chinos cubanos, and they all became, they just became part of all of us. I, I think I almost cried when I saw this picture and and saw that this Chinese immigrant was from Canton because that's where um, part of my family is from. Brad, tell us about Francisco Changsut, who is in this photo. Yeah, so this is Francisco Changsut, and I guess I'll start off by saying one thing I always like to do as the curator is I always want to tell a story that I think is largely unknown. You know, I know that there was Chinese Cubans People that grew up in Cuba know that, but a lot of people don't, right? And, you know, I get, I get paid to know. Um, so I get paid to think about the past. So I wanted to express this to people. And the interesting thing about Chinese Cubans is it comes at the end of the transatlantic slave trade. When people like Jose, right, are no longer going to be enslaved, a lot of um, Cuban plantation owners and um, Cuban business owners are going to look for labor. And so, as Marucci said, a lot of Chinese come over as indentured servants. And so I said, I want to tell this story, but there was a big problem. I didn't have any stuff. Chinese Cuban stuff is very difficult to come by, at least for me. I'm sure somebody will no, it is hard send to a question yeah. and say, no, I have a <laughs> bunch of that stuff. Well, that would have been great to know six months ago. Um, <laughs> but the way we put together our collection here at the History Center more generally and also for exhibits is sometimes we just kind of reach out blindly. And I knew the Changsut family, which was a local Cuban um, Chinese family, and I reached out to one of the family members. I was like, do you have any stuff? He's like, no, I probably don't. But, you know, you can come over and take a look. I do have some papers. And, of course, lo and behold, what does he have? <laughs> he has a picture of his great-great-grandfather. That's Francisco Changsut right there in the picture that you can see. Um, the Changsut's basically um, established a watercress farm. He married a woman named Carrie Dodd. They had a bunch of children, and um, they become successful. And so he takes these photos, and he turns them into postcards, and he mails them to his family members. Wow. What he also had was Francisco's death certificate, which is really interesting because he dies of tuberculosis, which mm -hmm. afflicted a lot of Chinese Cubans, and he's buried in the cemetery um, De Chino, yeah, so in the Chinese cemetery in Havana. So I was like, oh, well, this is a really interesting story, Lizette. I can take these family photos. Yeah. I can take these family pictures from the, the early 1900s, but then they also had stuff from the later decades, which we can talk a little bit about. Absolutely. That's a great lead-in to the next item that we're going to show them. There's the plane ticket of the great-grandson, right, of Francisco Changsut. Here it is here. Yeah, so... Kind of similar to Marucci's story, and she might want to jump in here. Um, what happens to the Changsu family is a very well-known Chinese-Cuban story. 
after the revolution, I talked to the family and they said, well, actually heading up to the revolutionary period, sort of moderately supportive of the revolution, right? But then when they see what the revolution has become politically, they become dissenters. And so then the family says, we should leave. And in 1962, what the Chiang Suit family is going to do, Francisco Chiang Suit, who died and is buried in the Havana, Cemet the Havana Cemet Chinese Cemetery, his son is going to book a ticket with Pan Am Airways. He's going to fill out his paperwork, and he's going to be allowed to leave Cuba. And one thing that the family had was that plane ticket that wow. he had to leave Cuba. And it was such a cool piece. Our graphic designer, and those of you that have gone to the gallery, you've seen this, she says, I'm gonna blow it up and put it on the wall. So it's on the wall, you see it as a graphic, and then you also see the ticket itself, Lizette, which I think is yeah. cool, it makes it a very powerful so, piece. So in, in essence, this is not the great grandson, this is Francisco Chang Suit's son's plane ticket. Yeah, if we go back, I don't know if it's possible to go back, but when you see the original Francisco Chang Suit, his, um, that's his son right there that's on his lap. Um, he's the one that's gonna leave. Wow. So yeah, the, the turnaround story for the Chang Suits is, is relatively, happens pretty quickly. And so the items that you have, you obtain from the great grandson. Yeah, so then, um, Francisco the second's grandson right that he was the one that um, donated the items to the History Center collection which is great I always like to say when I give public talks we're always collecting so if you have cool stuff <laughs> drop us a line I'll give you our cards um, so yeah he he was the one that donated the things for the show I just think it's so fabulous the way you get paid so such close attention to to each of the items um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there are items about the indigenous people of Cuba, Los Tainos, the Indians, and then you also follow the path of an Afro-Cuban family and, of course, the Chinese-Cuban family. Um, let's, let's talk about that corner um, of the exhibit hall where, you know, I've been there three times and all three times I hear, ah! come from that corner. And it's just the, the image of the chairs at the airport, the Pan Am chairs, it just elicits this response. And it's not just the chairs, there's, there's so many different things about it. And in that corner, there's a certain smell. And so let's talk about the chairs first, the Pan Am seats that elicit such a response. Yeah, one of our partners for the exhibit was the Delta Airlines Museum up in Atlanta. That's a really interesting facility because it's really for former employees, right? Um, but my colleague, Heather Culligan, who's the curator of collections, she had some, um, some interpersonal connections up there in Atlanta. And she said, well, let me reach out to them. And so as we do, we reach out, we say, you know, give us your stuff, but we say it politely. We say, you know, would you be interested <laughs> in loaning anything? And so they said, well, what are you after? And I thought to myself, well, what do I want? Um, and I thought, well, the chairs might be really cool because so many Cubans, like the Chang Suits, like Marucci's family, I'm sure Marucci will jump in here in a second, they remember sitting in those chairs. They remember leaving Havana. They remember something called the fishbowl, right, which basically segregated you from the rest of the airport. And so I put the chairs in, and I was like, okay, they're cool. And then I got a flight attendant's um, uniform that Heather and I went to Atlanta and picked up. And I said, well, that's a really interesting piece, too. And I thought it set the stage really nice in that mm -hmm. corner. But what I didn't expect, Lizette, was the emotion that the chairs, and this is why we put different textures in the show, it elicited. Um, on our member night, um, one gentleman walked up to me afterwards, and he looks at me. He had tears in his eyes. He goes, it's the chairs. And I go, what do you mean it's the chairs? He yeah. goes, the chairs. He goes, like you were saying, Lizette, he said, when I turned the corner and saw those chairs, I envisioned myself back in the Havana airport sitting there with my parents. It's the chairs. And that's why we do what we do, right? That's why, you know, it wasn't good enough to just throw papers on the wall. You know, we needed things. We needed different aspects of the show. Um, so, Marucci, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the fishbowl and your experience. As you can see, this is the chairs. Those are my family's intervention papers. The right papers above the chairs are the intervention papers. Right above the chair and the right. corporate brochure that says Azarine. Mm -hmm. That was the corporate brochure of our family business. Over here are the intervention papers, and it describes the exodus. The exodus right. from Cuba. It was the end of our life in Cuba. 
My father had already had an end of life in Spain, because when he lost his country in Spain, and here he, he and my mother were living, my father was reliving this again. I was a small child, but I could tell, you know, this was serious, because we did travel a great deal, so, but this was serious. We were leaving for good. Mm -hmm. This was the end of our life in the country where I was born the country where my mother was born, the country where our family had lived since 1917. And when you sit in the Havana airport, you sit in a fishbowl. It's called in Spanish, la pecera, la pecera, which means fishbowl. It's basically, and Lisette and I tried finding photographs of la pecera, which I think was probably torn down after 1963, um, but there are none. We couldn't find any. You, you mentioned that today to me because we weren't allowed to take photographs while we're sitting there waiting for our last time. And the sad part about it is is family and members are around you in this fishbowl, this glass wall. There are family members on the other side because only the passengers that are leaving the country can sit in that area. And unfortunately, it got to the point where people that were unhappy that you were leaving or they you were trying to show your independence and these people were hired to come and start screaming through the pecera worm gusano mm -hmm. those are the memories i remember i remember them going gusanos buying say gusanos worms leave traitors yeah. that's something for an eight-year-old to still remember quite quite passionately and that's why the chairs gave me such a pause yeah, and I just want to jump in. I'll add um, something to that story. The reason Marucci's, particularly her father's story, is so interesting, Rogelio, he, um, he's born in Spain, like Marucci said. He comes to Cuba. They establish this um, very profitable family business. It's confiscated by the state. They leave to the United States. They go to Harlem, Georgia. They come back to Plant City or come back to Florida, set up shop in Plant City. But then he goes and he travels to Spain in 1976 and he dies. And for me, as sort of the dispassionate historian, um, <laughs> it's an interesting story in that it's full circle, right? And it talks about this fluid movement of mm -hmm. this man, you know, from Spain to Cuba to the United States and back, back to Spain. But it's I, a very interesting story. I need to add something to the path of my dad because in 1976, I was in graduate school, and by the way, we're also Gators. Um, <laughs> we'll lighten this up. But um, when I was in school, my father said, I want to become an American citizen. And he'd always wanted to be an American citizen. He goes, but I've been waiting, because I want to become an American citizen during the bicentennial of the United States. Yeah. So my father applied to become an American citizen and was sworn in on July the 4th of 1976. Yeah. You'll see his natural, you can't make up this stuff. This stuff <laughs> is real. And you'll see his naturalization papers when he becomes an American citizen. And it's July the 4th, 1976. He died on September the 9th, 1976, as an American citizen in the, the land of his birth in Spain. Mm. And, and you know when we when we talk about la pecera, the fishbowl, for those of you who are not of Cuban descent and and really don't have a mental picture of what that is, um, there was a glass, a very thick glass that separated the section where people departing the country would be able to sit, and then on the other side of the glass, it wasn't like you know post 9/11 where we're so far away from the folks dropping us off at the airport. It, you were in the same room, but separated by this very thick piece of glass. And so, conversely, um, the opposite of what Marucci described, other families, like, like my mom's family, had, have different memories. And that is the memory of, you know, relatives touching the glass and trying to say their goodbyes. And the glass was um, not thick enough so as to block the sound. Like they could tell each other, I love you, I'll see you soon, through the glass. And so um, Marucci and I kept saying to Brad and to Billy, we want to include pictures of that. There, they, there's got to be pictures of that. We've seen them. We've seen them so many times before. And so what we realized after hours of searching for a picture of La Pecera, those black and white images that we, we know we've seen before. We came to the realization that we haven't seen them before. Marucci, they are burned in her memory. She remembers that room. I 
remember it. I can picture it because I've heard my mom and my dad separately tell the story, describe La Pecera, describe my grandmother and my grandfather touching the glass, saying goodbye to their only son. My mom touching the glass, having to say goodbye to her father on the other side who was not allowed to leave the country the day she left with her little brother and little sister. So that room was more, so much more than chairs and the gate of an airport. It was the, the location where your life ended in Cuba and a new life began. And, and it was just really emotional to be in that space. And so we realized that, no, there's no pictures of that. You know, of course, you know, soldiers would not allow any photographs to be taken. We were very far from tiny cameras, you know. Um, so, but we didn't realize that because we've heard the stories and you've lived them. We, we thought the things that we have in our hearts and in our minds are images that are out there um, for people to see, but they're not. Yeah, and if I can jump in, that is not unusual. One of the difficulties the curator yeah. always faces is, hey, you know, I have this stuff and I remember seeing this and you should put this in. And sometimes it's great and the stuff is great. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's imagination, right? Because people's lived experience. And this is yeah. a joke. It's kind of a cold hearted joke, but I'll share it with you all. Um, it, the curators always joke. We go, we only like to deal with the dead. Right, because the dead don't try to tell you their lived experience. We don't tell you what um, to do. The yeah, dead don't tell you what to do. The dead don't tell you what to do, <laughs> which is a joke, but it, it, it's really kind of poignant for us because obviously we want to tell you know mm -hmm. Lizette's story. We want to tell Marucci's story, but there is this interesting thing when you get into lived experience, and it can be very dangerous, right? When you're when you talk yeah. about about the living's experience. Of course, we do it because it's important, but um, it's an interesting facet of history that we deal with. So when you come around the corner and you see these chairs directly across from these chairs is that chug boat. Let's talk about the smell, the aroma, Brad. Yeah, so I think this will be the last artifact yes, we talk about. Yes, it is the about. last artifact. So, Before we, go, we open it up to Q&A. Yeah, so this is, I'll give you a real insider curator take on this. So the reason these boats are called chug boats is they tend to be Russian-made diesel engines. That's one of the reasons I like this piece so much. It's a Russian-made diesel engine from a four-wheel drive tractor that's repurposed, <laughs> lifted into what I'll call a makeshift craft. But this thing is heavily engineered. These people knew what they were doing. And then they chugged along. Well, when they landed, of course, they abandoned the boat. I don't know how quickly they were apprehended, but as I told you, I found out they were apprehended. When I got the boat, it had been on its side, and it had been left outside for, you know, probably a week or so. And so when we parked it in the History Center garage, we walked over to it, and we're like, oh, my God, it stinks. Like, it reeks of diesel and God knows what else. So we had a, um, a cleaning crew called Aftermath. They do crime scene cleanings. Crime scene cleanings. <laughs> they came and they cleaned it. <laughs> and then I jumped in it, and I said, I can't have the smell permeate the whole gallery. So I literally took an all saw, and I started to cut out some of the spray foam because one of the primary components of this boat is spray foam which just sucked yeah, up that it. diesel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can kind of see it. It's the yellow foam yeah. on the inside. And so I'm cutting it out, I'm cutting it out, I'm cutting it out. My, my colleague, Heather Culligan, comes down and she goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm cutting out some of the diesel smell. And we ultimately had to cut the boat in half. And she said, well, how much are you going to cut out? And I said, well, I don't know. I was going to cut it out until it doesn't smell anymore. She's like, you shouldn't do that. I said, really? She's like, the smell's part of the experience. Yes, I was like, it is. I don't know. It's going to kind of smell up the whole gallery. So anyway, we push it in there, and then everyone had different opinions, right? Some of our colleagues came in, they're like, oh, man, it stinks. <laughs> this is so horrible. This is the worst idea you've ever had. But you got confirmation from a photographer that you did the right thing, a news photographer. Right. Some of my colleagues said, I can't even smell it. So then the morning the exhibit opened, um, there was a cameraman that came in. They did a story. And he walks over to me, a lot like the man that sat on the airline seats. And he goes, I was just over by the boat. And I go, yeah. He goes, it's the smell. And I go, I know. I was worried about it. It probably smells too bad. He's like, no, no, the smell. He goes, that's part of it. You know, I can't imagine what it was like, but the smell, it takes me there. I can picture what it's like to be during, next to this chugging diesel engine, cutting across. Somebody asked how long it took. I don't know. My guess, though, is between 12 and 24 hours. Boat only goes about three to five knots. And so he was mm -hmm. like, the smell is part of it. So yeah, Lizette, you know, it's, it's another example of a, of a piece that kind of touches people in ways that sometimes as a curator, you know, we don't anticipate. 
The attention to detail in this is, is extraordinary. And, and again, I'll take this opportunity. I know I speak on behalf yes, of absolutely. Maruchi and myself to thank you for, for, for the, pa you, you keep saying the dispassionate curator, not at all. Um, the attention to detail and the love that you've put into this is, is just so wonderful. Um, at this point, we'd like to open it up to Q&A. Um, I know that we've had quite a few folks standing by on uh, Zoom asking uh, questions. And so I'd like to start with some of the questions from Zoom and then we'll open it up to the audience. Amanda has been monitoring the questions on Zoom. Amanda, can you tell us, uh, give us the first one. Uh, the, the coins on Marucci's necklace, did her mother intentionally make the necklace to disguise the coins or was the necklace originally made of coins? What type of coins are they? First of all, I made it into a necklace. They were bracelets. And I felt that they needed to be together because they belonged to my grandmother, my mother, and I. And so I made it into a necklace, and they are gold Cuban coins. A couple of them have Jose Marti on them, our Cuban patriot, who's our George Washington. And they date back to the 1800s. And my father had given them to my mother and my grandmother and his daughter throughout the years and different occasions. And these were the coins that were going to feed us and they're gold Cuban coins, and they did come in a bracelet. As a matter of fact, this is one of the bracelets. <laughs> so, but we needed to put them together because I needed to have all three women together. Thank you for that question, Amanda. Do you have one more? Yes. Go ahead. Um, why were some Cubans allowed to leave for the United States and some were not? Brad, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so it ebbs and flows over time. Um, there's always, well, there's, for most of the post-revolutionary period, so from 1959 to today, there's always been a quota of Cubans that leave the island. You'd have to apply to leave, and it wasn't guaranteed. So the Chang Suit family, for example, applied. It's one of the reasons why they had so many documents. You had to prove a bunch of things, and they were able to get on flights. Freedom flights are a great example. There was a big quota in the 1960s up to roughly the early 1970s. A lot of people, though, either couldn't get on those lists, and some of them couldn't afford it, right? And so then you have people taking to the sea. Um, so basically, there was no guarantee whether or not you would be able to leave or not. The last thing I'll say is it's always been part of the political calculation of the regime since 1959 to purge dissent. And one thing people leaving the island does is it purges dissent. And that's why you've seen it ebb and flow with Marielle, which we didn't talk about today because, you know, we'd be here all day, um, with freedom flights, with taking to the sea. These are political calculations as well to basically move what could be opponents um, of the revolution away from the island. And there's also the other aspect of punishment. Um, my, when my, my mother left Cuba as a teenager, my grandmother and my grandfather showed up with her at the airport. And because my grandfather had opposed the regime, he was allowed to think that he was leaving with his wife and children. And he was pulled aside at the airport and told, no, you're not going. And so at that moment, my mom realized that she was going to the United States with only her little brother and her little sister. So there's that aspect of punishment, of revenge in the 60s. Uh, where if you were known to have supported the regime before or you were um, outspoken against the Cuban government in the 60s, where um, there were all sorts of interesting ways that they, um, they punished those folks, and, and a lot of it was by not allowing the entire family unit to leave. And ironically, many of them were intentionally uh, made to believe that they were being allowed to leave, only to be taken off of the plane which is also some of the examples. Um, so we'd like to open it up to questions from the audience here. Um, are we going to, we have some here in the front and Nancy Delance, who's also here with the Tampa Bay History Center is gonna be bringing the microphone to you. She's here in the second row. Go ahead and raise your hand. What is your question? Um. Well, I, I don't really um, have a question. I was just chomping at the bit to um, say that I really, really appreciate this exhibit because I have my own uh, Cuban immigration story. I'm gonna try to keep it as brief as possible, but um, my dad came here on a freedom flight in 1968, and uh, my mom came via Spain in 1980. And 
I came around in 1992, not that that matters. But <laughs> um, yeah, this just really, really means a lot to me. And um, I kind of hope it had taken the whole floor instead of just half the third floor. Um, uh, last thing I want to say is that an additional uh, personal connection, again, I'm trying to keep this as brief as possible, even though I can talk to both of you all day. Um, I'll give you 20 that, more seconds. <laughs> My mom, who is sadly no longer with us, her name was Lisette, and she spelled it oh, the wow. exact same way you do, and she would make a big fuss about it. L-I-S-S-E-T-T-E. Yes. So Lisette. That's so funny. Thank you so much for, for sharing yeah, your story really with us. Yeah, this really meant a lot to me. That was all. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question in the audience? Here we, in the back. Please stand when you ask your question so we can see your pretty faces. What documentation is there that, um, that Cubans came to Tampa 100 years before Miami? Well, the big documentation is just, well, I have some of it on display, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the steamer timetable that shows when the steamer leaves Havana, when it gets to Tampa. Um, the soldiers, in particularly, actually, I think um, Officer Brooke wrote about some of the local Cuban fishermen that were around in the night in the 1820s mm -hmm. um, but it's really in that post 1860s moment when you have a lot of political upheaval in Cuba because it's a long fight um, for Cuban independence that's when we start to see the cigar workers come over and they're listed they're also listed in government documents the census all those types of things so we yeah. do have a pretty robust historical record of the movement of Cuban people to Tampa. I mean, Tampa was a town before Miami was a town. Yeah, you know, Tampa, you know, kind of like in the late 1800s, it's like Tampa Key West, it's a huge town, um, has right. a large, the largest population in Florida for a while, and then, you know, Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Miami, nobody's, nobody's in Miami until the 1900s, 1920s, really. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a, one more question that we can get to? Oh, we have Diane here, the, the publisher of 83 Degrees. Thank you for coming, Diane. I just wondered if there was a story behind that lacy tablecloth. <laughs> <laughs> story so, behind the beautiful lacy tablecloth, Maruchi. This is, a, this is an antique a lace tablecloth. We weren't able to bring it from Cuba, but many of you know I own a store that sells linens, and this came from my store, Villa Rosa Linens. And um, they said, want to personalize the conversation? This personalizes the conversation, along with our wonderful Ybor City cigars and our Cuban coffee maker. I did want to add, with regards to the exodus of why some people weren't allowed to leave, there's a section in the, uh, in the exhibit about Operation Pedro Pan. Many of you have heard that. It's a very top secret operation. It's Operation Peter Pan. And it's an operation where young children, young Cuban children, were sent. It was a combination of uh, Catholic charities, American Red Cross, and the United States government, beginning in the late 1960s, where they started hurting, getting people, getting children, out of Cuba on, unaccompanied by their parents, because the government, the Castro government, realized that there was a brain drain, and that they, did, they realized people were leaving, so who's going to run all these operations, factories, and things, all these people are going. So they would not allow lawyers, doctors, veterinarians, and certain, certain other people to leave Cuba. And these people wanted to get their children away because there had been, uh, there had been suggestions that they would be taken to camps to be re-educated in Russia and other parts of the world, and they wanted to get their children out of Cuba. Yeah, my grandmother and my grandfather refused to allow my mom and, the, and my aunts and uncles to go to school from that point on because they were afraid that they were going to be taken. So the P Operation Pedro Pan um, is the largest um, evacu evacuation of children in the history of the Western Hemisphere. 14,200 Cuban children came unaccompanied, many to the United States through Miami, many to never see their parents again. There are so many recounts of this, mm -hmm. and there are some celebrity, um, some very famous Cuban men, I, I can't think of any women right now, Senator Mel Martinez was an Operation Pedro Pan survivor. Carlos Eide, who wrote um, Waiting for Snow in Havana, yes. Pedro Pan survivor. So many of these Pedro Pan survivors were brought here or came here because their parents were not allowed to leave because they didn't want a brain drain. Thank you so much for coming. Before I turn things over back to Brad, um, I want to, again, take a moment to thank the supporters who've made tonight possible. We want to... Um, 
again remind you that this lex lecture series is made possible thanks to the support of the History Center's Endowment Fund at USF, also the AARP of Florida and USF Libraries, and the media support provided by WUSF Public Media. Um, Brad, take us out. Well, thanks for coming. Um, if you haven't had a chance to go check out the exhibit, please do. And um, we appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight. And thank you very much. And we'll be here for, for any of your questions if you want to come visit with us. Gracias. Thank you.